Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Mike's been a tremendous host. I mean, he's been really good to me. Did any of you other speakers get $200 for walking around money? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. It's the kind of guy he is. We've had a really good time together. I He mentioned he hadn't rained much, and I said, well, I'll pray about that. <laughs> Seemed to work a little bit. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to figure out where I am here. Uh, I went to the restroom there a while ago, and this lady tapped me on the shoulder, and she said, are you this morning speaker? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, you ever get nervous at these things? And I said, no, not really. She said, well, you're in the ladies' restroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll get settled down here in a minute. I really had planned on doing a little bit of lying. Uh, but there's a lady who came in just a bit ago, Ann from Tulsa, Oklahoma. There she is right there. We got sober about the same time, and we went to a lot of meetings together in the same area. So she knows me, so I can't lie much. But uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to get settled down here in just a minute. I uh, I kind of think that... Uh, Alcoholism is a belief system, in a way. Uh, is communism a belief system? Yeah. Is uh, capitalism a, be- a belief system? Catholicism, is that a belief system? Well, it seems like when you put the word ism, ism behind a word, it becomes a belief system. And alcoholics, uh, being an alcoholic, alcoholism is a belief system to me. And where did I get my belief system? I got it way back when I was real young, in my case. I don't know about anybody else's. Oh, by the way, I want to say, uh, Mary, thank you for inviting me here, and uh, I've really enjoyed the speakers. They've been tremendous. I, uh, I've, I've needed to listen a lot, and I have. Uh, everything in AA is a paradox. You know, everything's backwards from what I think it is. Has, has anybody ever called their sponsor so they could listen? <laughs> So I I needed to listen today and this weekend. I've heard some really good AA and some good al Both the al speakers were just tremendous. And uh, I, I thought sometime while they were talking, I said, I wonder if it was really other people's fault. You know, we couldn't do anything about that, could we? If it was really their fault. Now, I know one thing, that other people can't make you drink, and they can't make you sober. But they can sure make you thirsty as heck. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, my sponsor's name was Franklin. And, uh, one of my sponsors, he's dead now, bless his heart. But he always so- told me, he said, Joe, you want to say something before you start talking? And I'm going to try to do that. And uh, in my early days, I'd go to the meetings with him, and afterwards, he'd be coming back to my house. And he said, You know, the only way you can say less is talk longer. <laughs> Anybody know anybody like that? (laughs) And uh, he taught me a lot of things like that way. And uh, by the way, just for you, uh, we had a a big book trivia questionnaire thing the other day. In case you ever asked, what is the shortest paragraph in all of the big book? It works. Dash, it really does. That's the shortest paragraph in all the big book. So keep that in mind if you're ever involved in one of those trivia questions. You know, uh, my belief system, where I got things from, from me, you know, and uh, when I did my inventory, I tried to do what the what the big book suggested. I suggested that I just find the facts and face the facts and engage in the process to accept the facts. And I think that's what we do in AA when we do our inventory. And I need help from other people to help me do that. Thank God I had a sponsor who who was uh, acquainted with that. And he helped me see things about me that I couldn't see. He also said that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we're straightened out mentally and physically, the spiritual malady has to do with how I am on the inside as well as my relationship with God. 
And that's another reason to do the inventory. And remember, Dr. Jung told Roland that ideas, emotions, and attitudes which become the guiding force of the lives of these people are suddenly cast to one side, and a whole new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them, a belief system, if you will. And I go back into my life, and that's all I can do is go back to where I can, when I was a young fellow. And on page 18, this little one paragraph tells my whole story, and I could tell my whole story is on every page in this book today. But it says there, an illness of this sort, and we've come to believe it, an illness involves those of mouse in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all is sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, and anyone can increase the list. And it's been said so many times, in so many ways, it's today, this weekend. It's a family illness. And if you live with one of us very long, you're going to be affected by it in some manner. And some of us, uh, in, in my case, uh, I, look, I look back in my life, and my, my dad had an obsession to drink. An obsession is an idea that overpowers all other ideas, and is stronger than willpower. That's why my willpower, willpower doesn't work. But I didn't know that then. But my dad was obsessed to take a drink. And uh, my mother had an obsession to see that he didn't drink. <laughs> And it seems like every time my dad took a drink, my mother had a personality change. <laughs> Isn't that right? And uh, we left the farm out there in, in, in Salisaw, Oklahoma, and went out to California. And we didn't fit in real good out there at that time. Later on, we fit in just real good. And uh, we didn't fit in real good out there. So we came back to Tulsa in the late, late 30s and early 40s and ended up in West Tulsa. And here's my dad with a wife and five kids and come off the farm. He wasn't prepared to, for the big city. He had to be full of fear. He got him a job. I mean, I would be full of fear with that today. My wife and five kids and not equipped, not equipped to feed them and take care of them. It scared the heck out of me. And he got a job as an ice man. And in those days, you carried ice on your back from one house to another. Because we have, didn't, most of us didn't have any refrigeration. <clears throat> Backbreaking work. Six days a week, less than minimum wage. And uh, we lived in a in a two-room house over there in West Tulsa where the bathroom was outside, and everything was outside that two-room house. You could look down through the floors and see the chickens running underneath the, underneath the uh, floor. Pretty poor area. My dad would get paid on Saturday, and he'd go by the bootlegger in those days and pick up a pint of that rock gut whiskey, we called it, quite lightning. And he'd bring it to the house, and he'd have a drink. And I and I believe my dad deserved a drink. After six days of back-breaking work, he deserved a drink, and he should have a drink if he wanted it. But my mother saw that dollar going for alcohol when it could have been feeding these five kids, and she was afraid, too. And she raised hell with him about his drinking. And I grew up in this, and I was affected by it emotionally as a young child. And, of course, I don't know this until after I get into AA and look back at it. And I was affected by it. And we know that alcoholism is a progressive illness. It gets worse. It never gets any better. And uh, slower over ten, a period of time, it got worse in my life. My dad continued to drink and drink harder, and my mother and he fussed and fought a lot. Things were being thrown around. Knives were pulled out and threatened with, and guns were used and pointed at each other. And it was awful. And I grew up in this and was affected by it emotionally. Uh, my dad's drinking got to be real bad after a while, and, I, and now I'm about eight years old, seven, eight years old. And from time to time, he would tell us kids, he said, boys, I'm going to take your mama out this weekend, and I'm going to kill her. And they'd leave on Friday and be gone. And I'm at home, and I'm wondering, I'm seven, eight years, is he going to do that this time? I wonder if he's going to do that this time. Is he? And I'm awake and scared to death. Finally, he comes in, and I'm relieved. Well, my mother, I guess she finally got tired of that deal, and she she uh, finally got up the courage to leave. And how they got up the courage to leave, I don't know. You know, that's back in the days when you don't. You just stay in there no matter what happens. Well, she eventually uh, took us kids and ran away from home, and she called the police, and they put us up in a shelter. And uh, 
they arrested him and, and eventually they sent him to Eastern State Hospital in Bonita, which is our local nut house. And they didn't have any treatment facilities in those days, so they put him in the criminally insane ward. And that's what they do with alcoholics of our type back in 49, 50, 51. And he was to say they really got well. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> My dad was there from three for three years, seven months, and thirteen days, and he was an alcoholic in the criminally insane ward. If he was ever introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't know anything about it. Uh, later on, he was to get out of there and an out of state release and move to California, and we were left to get bigger. But during those three years, he had seven months and thirteen days. I had some of the most formidable ideas of my life, the ideas, emotions, and attitudes which become the belief system in my life I acquired along in there. Now remember my mother's got five kids and she's busy as she can be but letting them get bigger. We didn't get raised up. She got big we got bigger. And that was all she could do to get that done. Washing, ironing, cooking, cleaning, you know. So uh I'd go back and forth, my brother and I would hitchhike up to Benita would take my dad a couple of dollars and a carton of cigarettes from time to time. And we'd go back into the Kremlin and Sane Ward. And I would see things back in there that nobody, but nobody's supposed to see. Men in diapers and things like that. and Hands tied behind her back and sticks in her mouth. And it was awful. It was awful. And I'm just seven, eight, nine years old. And going home from there, I got a bunch of ideas and emotions and attitudes which become the guiding force of my life. And one of them was this. One day it just came to me. I wasn't taught this. It just came to me. And I said, if God, got to blame it on somebody, right? Yeah, that did. If God is going to do this to me and to us and to hell with God, and I'll never go to that dang church again. And if I ever get big enough, they can't catch me. I'm not going either. And I got big enough, they couldn't catch me, and I didn't go either. And another thought came to me one day coming home from up there was if it feels like this to love people, I'm going to quit loving people. It hurts too bad. And so I began to push people out of my life. And another thought came to me was this. If anything good is going to happen in my life, it's going to happen because I, all alone, without any help, made it that way. So I didn't need God, nothing, or nobody. And I lived my life that way. Now, those are not very good coping skills. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought they were very brave skills on my part. Until after I got into AA, come to find out the most fearful skills I could ever have. And today I see people walking around in the in the world, and I see them pushing and shoving and talking ugly and this and that, and I know exactly what's wrong with them. They're scared to death, just like I was. And so I grew up in this. And in my area of, of town, there was two people, two kinds of people. There was people that run people home from school, and those people who got run home from school. And I became one of those who run people home from school because I was scared. See, if you ever got you running, you, they couldn't stop. And I wouldn't run. So that's the way I grew up. And if you uh, threatened me or if I had perceived a threat from you, it was not good for you. And uh, they put you in jail for that kind of attitude, by the way, and the things that I did. <laughs> they did that. And uh, one time I was in Arizona. I'm just... 13, 14, 14 years old, and I'm in a bar, big for my age, drinking. I've been drinking a while, and I uh, got into a bar fight with this guy. And I uh, won't go through all the gory details, but they gave me 7 to 15 for aggravated assault. And if that guy had to die, you'd have a different speaker here today, so I'll tell you about that. But thank God he didn't, so it was just aggravated assault. And that was the type of guy that I was. I got out of there, and I eventually went into the Army. And uh, on the way on the bus. I volunteered draft at the age of 17. You can't do that, but I did. And uh, went on down on that bus and, and met a guy there. His name was George Gibbs. He's dead now. But I said, how do you remember George, little black guy there? And if, you, if you knew George, you loved him because he loved everybody. And he come walking down the aisle of that bus that day and he was wearing a, a straw hat that was flat on the top and a diamond stick pin in his cravat. And, uh had on this pinstripe suit, black pinstripe suit, carrying a cane, wearing spats. Boy, he was a Tulsa dandy. 
<laughs> and the seat was full, the bus was full except for the seat next to me. And I said, you can sit down here if you want to. That's when Bubba and Forrest met. <laughs> Later on, we were, <laughs> he was to come back into my life. So we went in the Army together and uh, drank and all that stuff. And I came out and I said, now I'm going to try to build my life and I'm working hard. And I met this lady who happened to have two children. And uh, we dated and drinking and all that. And we got drunk. And one morning we woke up and we were sober. I mean, we were married. <laughs> we never did get sober. We got married. And I don't know what happened, but she was a lovely lady. She was really a nice lady. And, uh, and all she wanted was a home and a raise these two kids, and, and she really did love me. But you know, there was something going on with me, and I didn't understand it. I could not go home. I wanted to go down to bars, those jazz places uptown that Bill talks about, and to sit there and chatter and thousands and chatter and talk about millions, and we didn't have a damn dime, but we talked a lot about it. <laughs> and uh, I liked that. At one time in my life, I, I was like Bill. At one time in my life, I was quite capable of making a lot of money. And I made a lot of money for a lot of people, believe me. And uh, I'm quite capable of losing a lot of money, too, by the way, <laughs> which I did that. But uh, I, I like that life. And, and my friends and I would go down there and we'd talk about things and business and so on and so forth, and we'd split a half a pint. The next thing I know, it's we're splitting a pint. And it gets later and later. And I'd go home, and there she'd stand, madder than heck. And uh, some morning, sometimes I'd come home, and she'd throw all my stuff out in the yard. <laughs> Do you all know what I mean by stuff? <laughs> dirty T-shirts, dirty shorts, shirts that needed ironing. They never throw out anything clean. <laughs> I'd like to know why. But she didn't. And, and put a, uh, filed for divorce and put a restraining order on me and told me not to ever come back. And I... She did that four times. Oh, make me so mad. I, no, you know, no wonder she did that because a lot of times when I leave, I just would just leave and then I just didn't come back. And when I did come back, it was just like I'd been gone a half an hour. And one time I was sitting down at the bar, the Zebra Lounge, wonderful place. I almost smell it now. And I got to thinking, y'all know either drink or think, but don't get the two of them mixed up. <laughs> and I said, hmm, oh, old Rose hadn't seen me in about three months. I think I'll go home and visit. <laughs> Do y'all know what I mean by visit? Anybody? <laughs> okay. I think I'll go home and visit. And so I went over to my home to visit, and I knocked on the door, and what she did was she kind of peeked out, and I just broke in what I did and got in there. And there sat an old boy about Wayne's size in my recliner <laughs> watching my TV in my house, and I'm making payments on all that. What are you going to do? But I did. I jumped on that old boy, and he liked to beat me to death in my own living room floor. <laughs> Put me out in the yard and told me not to ever come back. <laughs> I lived on that a long time. So I start thinking real good now. And I think, well, I'm going to drink. It's a given. Okay, I know I'm going to drink. Now I need to find me a woman that drinks. You know, I'm going to have to have a woman and we we'll have one that drinks. Because these women that don't drink are mean and ugly. <laughs> Throw your stuff out. And so I met my second wife, Phyllis, my current wife. I call her my current wife. Uh, she come in, and she was introduced to me, and I looked at her, and she said, Joe, you know, you look like my third husband. <laughs> I said, my God, how many have you had? And she said, two. <laughs> Boy, I like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. And we started dating, and uh, we drank a lot together in, in Tulsa. At that time, you beer bars, you drank beer till it closed at midnight, and then you went to a nightclub, you drank till wee hours in the morning, you went to the restaurant, you had breakfast, and you went to work. Rarely did you sleep much. You could do that in those days. And I liked her. I mean, that's the way we, that's the way we dated. And after a while, we got married. Now, I didn't know this, 
but I knew about me. I had a list of things about this long that I wasn't going to let her do, like that other one did. And she had a list of things about this long that she wasn't going to let me do that that other one did of hers. And we got married, and we're drinking, and we're enforcing our list on each other. Ooh, <laughs> terrible. We couldn't drink together. We couldn't go anywhere together without fussing and fighting. So we kind of made a deal. We would split up Tulsa, 41st Street, you know where that is, and and north and east and west was mine. 41st Street South, east and west was hers. <laughs> and I wouldn't bother her. And she don't bother me, okay? And I'm on my side of town one night, some months later, up by Keystone Lake. And I bought me a little mobile home up there and put it on the lake. It's a lovely place. And I didn't think Phyllis knew anything about it. One morning, there's a knock on the door. And I kind of go to the door and open. Well, she just broke in, is what she did. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassed me in front of my girlfriend and stuff. <laughs> Terrible. Next morning I got up and all my stuff laid out in the yard like it was supposed to be. Stole my car. Went to the bank and made off what little money we had. Filed for divorce again. She did that three times. <laughs> well, she only did it twice, but I filed for divorce on her once. And it was, she didn't even know about that one. But... Uh, put a restraining order on me and told me not to ever come back and after all I'd done for her. <laughs> her treat me like that. And well, my, I, I know I need, oh, I got to go here. <laughs> I didn't intend to stay sick this long. <clears throat> <laughs> By the way, when you see a speaker look at his watch, you know what that means? Nothing. Uh, it just gives you a sense that I'm going to quit pretty soon. <laughs> but I'm not. Anyhow, I, I, that, that, that mobile home got full of rats. I'm talking about <laughs> one of them jumped right out of the ceiling about like this one night on my bed. And I kicked the fire of that guy. I mean, I mean, it took me forever to get him off the bed. And the next morning I woke up and I was wringing wet all over for sweat. My clothes were wringing wet from fighting those rats all night. So I decided to sell that place and get out of there. And so I moved back to Tulsa. Oh, by the way, if you're ever in a meeting and you see people who come in, they're seeing things that you're not seeing, go along with them. Because they're seeing them, I guarantee you they are. So I moved back to that little, back to the apartment there at 51st and Lewis, and, and I continued to drink. Now, my last day of drinking was a typical day in my life, at least a typical Saturday morning. I'd been out most of the night, Friday night drinking. Uh, I got up, woke up Saturday morning, had three or four drinks and four or five cigarettes and went back to sleep. Well, I passed out again, what I did, but I didn't know that then. I just went back to sleep and woke up again about two or three o'clock in the afternoon and had two or three cigarettes and four or five drinks and went back to sleep. And about five o'clock in the evening, I did the same thing. And by this time, I'm buying them white crosses by the 500 bag and eating them like popcorn. That's the end of my drug story. And uh, But when you do that and drink, you get busy. And uh, I had a nice one-bedroom apartment back there, and a uh, new bedroom, new, new mattresses, new lamps, new everything. I bought it new. But I was too busy to get uh, light bulbs and sheets and stuff like that. So I slept on the couch. And that's the way I did. I got up and went and go about my little bars that I would circle around to and stay there a little while and ended up in a place called the Misty Dawn over in West Tulsa. Beautiful place. <laughs> and uh, there's some people who owned that bar who we had been having fights with for years. And these guys had been in jail for killing people. I mean, really. And it was a kind of bar over there that if you walked in, the, one of the bartenders would say, hey, you have a gun? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, here, take this one. <laughs> and really? I mean, you, <laughs> I'm not kidding. You, you need one in there. Anyhow, uh, these guys were out to get me, and I'm in their bar. And a couple of my friends had to pull their guns to get me out of there. Two weeks later, I'm back over there. Now, I don't know what kind of insanity that is, but I'm back over there. And I'm sitting on the bar stool, been drinking all day and that evening, and 
about midnight. And I'm sitting there, and I had a real sick feeling in my stomach. It wasn't a throwing up sick. It was a, a feeling like I'm just going to, everything in me is just going to drop out. And I didn't know what that feeling was. And I got up off that bar stool, and I went on and got in my car and lay down for a little while and went back about 4 o'clock in the morning, back to that little apartment I'd been living in Saturday, Sunday morning and laid down on the couch. And I know why I laid on the couch now. I'm too scared to go back there. I stayed up on the couch. We turned the light on and the television and the radio. But I didn't know that then and uh, tried to sleep. The next morning I kind of came to or woke up and sitting there reliving my life and thinking about a thousand things. My mind raced uncontrollably. You know what I mean. That's what Bill said. And run this stuff all my life through my head, trying to find an answer for where I, how I ended up where I was. I never intended to be where I was. And I don't know of anybody in AA who's ever said, golly, at 14, I can't wait till I drink it and run it and tear it all up and lose it all and end up in AA. I mean, that was not part of my plan. And I'm thinking, what happened? What, what, what's going on? And it came to me that I'm going to have to quit drinking. If, if I'm ever going to get my life straightened out and get back with my wife and my daughter and, and get my life, I'm going to have to quit drinking. And I knew by this time that I couldn't quit drinking. That's the main reason I quit drinking, because I couldn't quit drinking. You understand? <laughs> and somehow, deep down within me, there was a thought came. I don't know where this came from, because I didn't pray for it. God was going to have to be involved in this deal. I just knew that. And I did two things that morning that I hadn't done in many, many years. And the first thing I did was I got on my knees beside that couch. And I said, God, if you'll help me <clears throat> to find a way to stay sober, I'll do what I can for you from this day forward. Had been used to since I was seven years old. I'm not in church hardly, occasionally from time to time. And after a couple of hours, it looked like God wasn't going to help me. So I called my friend George, a little black friend George. We met in the army, and I'd seen him four or five years prior to this. And he told me he was going to AA, and I remembered I felt real sorry for George. <laughs> <laughs> so I called George and I said, "George, are you still going to AA?" And he said he was. I did another thing that I don't do. I said, George, I need help. I asked another human being for help. I don't do that. You see, you got to be pretty badly mangled emotionally. I mentioned the other the, last night. You have to concede to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic. That don't mean I just agree with that idea. What that means is I have fought one hell of a fight and I lost. Totally whipped totally beat up in every area of my life. I asked God for help in another human being. George came to my house, and he stayed with me for the next three days. This is the best that Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer, and I didn't know that. And he stayed with me, and he's wiping the sweat off my brow and the stuff off of my lips and trying to help me get sober three days. <clears throat> Finally, uh, on the third day, he took me to my very first AA meeting, and that was on November 3rd, 1973. He set me down around the tables of Alcoholics Anonymous, my solution, if you will. And you know what went on in my head? I said to myself, what's a nice guy like me doing in a place like this <laughs> with people like you? <laughs> Therein lies the problem. <laughs> Sunday morning, I was hopeless and helpless as I have ever been. Tuesday, three days not drinking. That old pride and ego, and I don't need God nothing or nobody begin to come back. The thing that damn near killed me, three days not drinking, begin to come back. And that's really what we're talking about in Alcoholics Anonymous. My whole belief system began to come back. Thank God for sponsorship. George helped me tremendously. Because on page 20, it talks about here... Uh, how many times people said, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? That paragraph. And it says down the back of them is a world of misunderstanding and ignorance. Page 70 says, the only thing to keep a man in everlasting ignorance is contempt prior to investigation. 
I submit to you that I was ignorant. Ignorant. And I really believe in alcoholics anonymous, you gotta become ignorant so you can start to learn. My whole belief system had collapsed. Everything that I held of value didn't work. And my sponsor, George, and my other sponsor, Franklin, after George had had some problems, helped me to find a different way to think and a different way to feel about things. Thank God they did that. I was uninformed. I don't like to say ignorant much anymore, but I was uninformed about so many things. I didn't know anything about God. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had the spiritual knowledge of a seven-year-old boy, eight, nine-year-old boy. Told you about that. Had this coping skills of an eight or nine-year-old boy. Uh, when I was about 12 years old, I got to thinking about sex a lot. Almost gave me brain damage. <laughs> or maybe it did. And I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I've been thinking about sex. And she couldn't talk to my dad. He was gone. And scared her. She said, oh, my God, Benny Joe. She said, the only reason you're supposed to have sex is to have children. Figured that out. Well, see, had five children, sex five times. Well, no wonder my dad was in the nut house, I thought. You know? <laughs> and she said, it's a dirty, filthy, rotten thing to think about, and you ought to save it for the one you love. <laughs> So I, I somehow I didn't believe that. I went to the only source of information that was available to me. In West Tulsa, Oklahoma, in front of the Jenkins Cafe, 21st and Quanta, there was a bunch of wise, intelligent, experienced men and women of about 14 or 15 or 16 years old, and they knew everything there was to know about it and more than happy to share it with me. And these guys told me that they were going out with sometimes four or five different women a night, they said, and did all the things that I was fantasizing about, they said. And I was sober now because I was about four years before I figured out they were lying to me. <laughs> or at least I hope they were. I never could live up to that. How many of you kind of got your sexual knowledge somewhat like I did? Well, you guys are... You had sex education in school, I guess. <laughs> Call it recess at home, but <laughs> that's the way I got my information. So, you see, I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing. The things that I learned, I learned on the streets from people that didn't know any better about it than I did. So I didn't know nothing when I got here. Thank God people helped me with, with that. And one of my biggest problems was after a while, <clears throat> Franklin said, you you're having trouble with this God idea, aren't you? I said, I'm having a terrible time with God. I'm having a terrible... I mean, I was... Ask God for help, then I'm sober now, and I began to have a terrible time with God. And he asked me to, to read on page 25. Give me some information. He said, almost none of us like the self-searching, the living of our pride, the confession of shortcoming, which the process requires for successful confirmation. But we saw that really worked in others. We come to believe in the hopeless and futility of life that we've been living in. When therefore we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up a simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven and have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. You know, I like that idea about being rocketed somewhere, don't you? <laughs> I'm interested. He said, the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. And I didn't know what a spiritual experience was. And a lot of people in this early writings of this book, they didn't know either. That little asterisk there refers you to fully explained on Appendix 2. It wasn't in the first book. And they began to talk about spiritual experience and spiritual awakenings. They got me some old ideas conjured up in my mind. When I was young, from time to time, they'd catch me and take me to church. And my Aunt Much, she was much of a lady. That's why we call her Aunt Much. <laughs> and uh, she got into the spirit this thing one night. Next thing I know, she's speaking in a strange language that I never heard of before. Jumping up and down, rolling around in the sawdust and stuff, and squealing and hollering. And she was having a spiritual experience. And I thought that's what I was going to have to have. And I was dreading it. I mean, really, I was. <laughs> Thank God for people like me, they wrote that information back here on, on page 569. 
On page 27, it says, for further amplification, see Pi 69. And on page 47, it says, please see this information on spiritual experience for further amplification. Because they want, they want me to understand what they meant by those terms. If, if the one that I meant, that I understood, is a whole lot different than what they said. And they wrote down here the term spiritual experience and spiritual awakenings. They're used many times. Basically, it means to change, change, change. Uh, personality change, uh, uh, spectacular upheaval. So upheaval means to change. Transformation, to transform something means to change. Uh, alteration means to change. The whole key word is to change. And boy, I wanted to change. I really did want to change. And uh, I like that idea. Because I used to come to these meetings and I'd stand in the back of the room and I'd look down at my feet and I was ashamed of what I'd become. I wanted to be different. And uh, so I picked me out some heroes. We all got our heroes in AA, and I think we need them. I did. And I picked out me some heroes, and I tried to emulate them and be like them. It's the only thing I could do. I couldn't be like me because I didn't like me. And if you knew me, you wouldn't like me either. So I tried to be like you. And we were talking earlier. A lot of our heroes are gone. I, I needed them. I miss them. Today I miss them. But after a while, I begin to realize the type of change they're talking about is not to change to be something else. The type of change they're talking about is to change from what I had become to that which God intends for me to be. That's the type of change that I'm looking for in Alcoholics Anonymous. She said this morning, I am what I am. And I'm happy with me today, you know, because I know who I, am, who I am and what I am. My name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic and a child of God. That's who I am. And it's built with his image within me. See, I know that. But you see, that, that's what I, information that I needed to know in order to get ready to, to uh, make this decision they were going to ask me about a little bit later. And later on on page 46, Franklin was saying to me, showing me, the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, he said, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God, our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and effect a contact with him. In my understanding, God was very limited. It was that of a seven-year-old boy. And he said, Joe, why don't you do something tonight? Why don't you go home and take you a pencil and a piece of paper and write down, if you could make God, if you could, what would you want it to be? So I wrote down some things that I would like God to be, realizing that I couldn't make God, but if I could, what would I want it to be? And I wrote those down, and I presented them. And he said, that's good. You can start there. See, I didn't know you could do that. Out in Oklahoma, in them Southern Baptist Church, and whole, you go to hell for doing that. <laughs> but you see, he gave me permission, and I needed that permission. I needed a, a starting place. I needed some place to start, and that was a starting place for me. And it goes on to say, you know, you know, by the way, you know why that idea of my own conception, you know why that works so well? I've never had any trouble with my conception of anything. Have you? It's my idea. It's good, right? <laughs> but I need a starting place. And it says, uh, as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard a turn for those who seek him. Key word. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. It's open, we believe, to all men. And I said, you mean i got to find God? And they said, Joe, God's not lost. <laughs> he said, first of all, it's not in the, in the finding it's in the seeking. And if you will seek God into your life, he will disclose himself to you. And then you'll have an understanding of God that nobody can improve upon. I had to start somewhere. So I started with that little simple idea. And it goes on to say that when, when therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies to the other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice. Prejudice means old ideas. Do not let any prejudice or old ideas you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. The chapter, We Agnostics. Gnostic means knowledge. Put the ag in front of it means without. 
those of us who are without knowledge or any experience with it. Old ideas, prejudice. I had a lot of prejudice, old ideas about this. But, uh, you know, uh, Father Bill, remember Father Bill? Father Bill Wilson was his name. And he was in La Jolla, California. And uh, Father Bill told us one time when we were talking, and I, I'm glad I was able to spend some time with him, a very educated, well-educated man, went to University of Rome, studied for 30 years, become an alcoholic through drinking the wine, ended up in La Jolla, California. <laughs> and he said, this chapter, We Agnostics, is the greatest piece of spiritual information that he had ever read. Quite a statement from a man like that. And he said, this chapter, We Agnostic, is not here to prove to me that there's any particular type of religion or any particular type of God. That is not the reason for this, this chapter. He said, this chapter is here simply to open up my mind to a point that God might prove to me that there's a God. Honestly, asking yourself what they mean to me. That's all I need to do is to seek. What does this mean to me? What do I understand about this? It's in the seeking. It's not in the finding. He said, we need to ask ourselves one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe? The atheist can come to believe and the agnostic can come to be willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself. And as soon as a man can say that he does believe or is even willing to believe, we in fact assure him he's on his way. And Franklin said, Joe, if you can't find a power greater than yourself, at least find one other than yourself. <laughs> I can do that. Because <laughs> I didn't need God nothing or nobody. I'm beginning to understand what it means now. I'm beginning to understand. So it's not in the it's not in the finding, it's in the seeking. And a little bit later on in this chapter, we agnostic, I needed to know what God was. And it says deep down inside of every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. You're just born with it. It's just there. No matter how much I try to deny it, it's just there. We're born with it. God is as much a part of me as my makeup. Deep down within every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. I look for God everywhere. He's everywhere. He's everything or else he's nothing. But he's also within me. That's the last place I ever look for God is within me. And he's there. And he will disclose himself to me if I seek him within. He goes on to say here, and this is a whole summing up of this chapter we agnostic. Said we can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice. That's telling our stories, helps sweep away prejudice, old ideas, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself. Then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. Now, get this. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. Seeking God into my life, eventually. He will disclose himself to me, and then I'll just know. Just know, and I just know. See? And that's one thing I know more than anything today. I know that I know that I know <laughs> that I know that God is within. Look within. Okay, so now I'm ready to do this thing that they're talking about. And I know what they're talking about. They're talking about me turning my will and my life over the care of God. That's the main purpose of this book. Its main object is to enable me to find a power greater than myself which will solve my problem. It didn't say it would help me to solve my problem. I find the power and the power will solve the problem. And that is God within me. He told us through all those, all those different stories about Jim, Jay Walker, Fred, and all those guys. And on page 43, he said, once more. See, he just told us through all those experiences. And Bill and Bob, and once more he's going to tell us. He said that, he said that, uh, I'll read it here if I can find it. But I don't, I don't like to misquote this. He said, once more the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. Can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. Can't think your way out of it. Had a friend of mine recently, you'll remember Kermit. About three years ago, his daughter coming back to AA. Kermit was sober 29 years. 
And she said, would you call Dad? I said, yeah, I'll call him. What happened? He said, he got drunk again. So I called him. I said, Kermit, what happened? I want to know. Quit going to meetings. Quit praying. Quit helping others. And one day, for no reason that he could think of, it seemed like the most natural thing to do was take a drink. The defense must come from a higher power. Can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. Kermit missed that. He started drinking as old like Fred did, as old the, gin, well, the booze was like ginger ale, just nonchalantly. But what happened to him? He's not back yet. So I keep coming to these meetings. So now they're getting ready to tell me how it works. They did that. They told me that how, how it works. Said if you're convinced on these three vital issues, A, that you're alcoholic and cannot manage your own life, B, that probably no human power could relieve your alcoholism, C, that God could and would, people saw it. Being convinced of that, you're ready to take step three. Which meant they took the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters to do steps one and two. Because I didn't know that. I'm glad to hear Bob mention the doctor's opinion. Most important. Most important. And uh, they, I heard 164 pages, uh, 160, 173 pages. Because in the original printing of the book, the first 16 printings of the doctor's opinion was on page one. 1955, they put the doctor's opinion in the Roman numeral section. Alcoholics don't read Roman numeral section, do they? <laughs> Skip right over those babies. But the doctor's opinion... The rest of this book is going to tell me how to recover from the condition of the body and of the mind that he described. I need to know what the problem is. If I don't understand what the problem is, how am I going to implement the solution? The doctor's opinion is the problem. And then I'm acquainted with the solution. And they wrote a chapter, there is a solution. And uh, Bill knew we weren't going to be like it anymore than he did. So they wrote a chapter about more about alcoholism more about what's going to happen to us unless we accept this solution that they described. And then he gave it, we're going to have problems with God out there just like I did. So he wrote the chapter, We Agnostics, so that we could begin to seek God into our life and question what they mean and begin to get this feeling deep down inside of every man, woman, and child of the fundamental idea of God. And you see, I, all back in my life, I could remember from time to time, I would have get re- get ready to do something. And my little voice within me would say, Joe, I don't believe by five of you, I'd do that. But I wouldn't pay any attention to that. i just go ahead and do it and get in all kinds of trouble. And then after I'm in trouble, this little voice would say, see, I told you not to do that. <laughs> That's my God consciousness within me talking to me. All you do is listen. Listen to yourself. And then you'll know what to do. You'll intuitively know what to do. So he told us that Selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of our problem. That's an understatement, I believe, in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> That's why the program doesn't work. It's because of selfishness and self-centeredness. You can't get rid of selfishness and self-centeredness even if you want to. You can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. Only God can remove that, you see. Of course, I don't know that. And then he tells us how it really works. He says, this is how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. I was playing God in my life. I didn't need God, nothing, or nobody. Playing God in my life. And the lives of those who lived with me. And I made their lives miserable, trying to make them mind. The book says people just don't mind, do they? <laughs> <laughs> they don't mind. They're not going to mind. If if they'd only do as they wish, the show would be great. I know that. <laughs> but they won't mind. And, you know, God gave us all a self-will. And that's the problem with it. Everybody's got one. And my will for you is one thing, and your will for me is one thing, and my will for me is one thing, and your will for you is one thing. And I can't force my will on you. And the more I try to do that, the more trouble I have. Oh, boy, I've had lots of trouble trying to do that. My wives don't mind. She still don't mind. But I don't try to force my will on her as much as I used to. He said, next, see, there's the instruction. Next, we decided hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. I'm going to let God direct my life. I'm going to quit directing my life in the lives of other people. I'm going to ask, let God to be the director of my life. 
He's the principal with his agents. He's the father with his children. Most good ideas are simple. And boy, I almost missed that simple idea. He's the father. We're the children. He's the principal. We're the agent. He's the boss. You see, I do. I, he's not my boss. I mean, I am not the boss. He is the boss, and I am his child. He tells me what to do. He's the director of my life. Most good ideas are simple. I almost missed that. I used to pray, God, give me this, and God, give me that. God, help me get a new car, and God, help me make more money, and God, get my wife back, and God, do this. I use God like he would an errand boy. You see? And after I'd been sober a while, I got to reading in that other big, big book, and in there it said there that God worked for six days, and then he rested. Now, to my knowledge, he'd never go back to work anymore. <laughs> It looks to me like there's going to be any work being done around here. It's going to be me. <laughs> you see? He's the father. We're the children. He's the principal. We're the agent. He's the boss. I work for him. Most good ideas are simple. And I almost missed that. He said, this was a concept, was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch of which we have passed to freedom. And that's the way to freedom in my life. He said, now, when we sincerely took such a position, the one just described, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer, being all-powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. <laughs> I'm supposed to perform his work well. You see, not, he's not supposed to perform my work well. That's why we stay busy in AA, hey, helping other people, as you mentioned this morning. As long as I'm busy... Helping other people, I can't think about me. See, somewhere or another, he, he takes care of my life, and he ha hasn't worked out that way. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves and our real plans and designs. More and more, we became in interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. See, takers are losers. I, don't, I didn't know that. I always wanted what I wanted when I wanted it. And if you didn't give it to me, I took it from you. That's why they put you in jail, by the way, didn't mind See, takers are losers. I'm trying to see today what I can contribute to life, what I can give to AA and God and my understanding and the people that I sponsor and the people that sponsor me. I'm trying to see what I can contribute. He said, as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, we became conscious of his presence. We began to lose our fear today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. God, I hated that idea about being reborn. I really did. I remember my first wife. Uh, one time I throwed a little sober spell trying to get back home. <laughs> I even went so far to go see her preacher. And I mean, I was desperate. I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't fooling around. I went to see the preacher trying to get back home. I was serious. And I uh, went in there and he sat me down across the table and he said, Joe, what seems to be your problem? Well, I don't know what the problem is. I haven't been to AA. I told him what I thought it was. It was her. If you live with her, you drink too, I said. Well, you know, they'll give you a solution, won't they? And he told me that you must, and boy, did he emphasize that word, you must have faith in these things. And he told me what they were. And I walked out of there because I couldn't do what he asked me to do. How can you have faith in something that you don't even believe? He asked me to have faith. Thank God for the second step where I could come to believe. Then, afterwards, I could have come to have faith. And the, 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 process, the process begins with step three. You see, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over the care of God. You know, willingness is the key. And you know, how do you get willingness? You don't get it in here. You get it out there. You drink a lot of whiskey. And if you live, you'll become willing. I guarantee you will. <laughs> Some people drink and quit just a little too soon. <laughs> I believe what the book said. It said, if you don't believe this stuff, go out there and try some more drinking. I believe in drinking. He said, go to the nearest bar room, by the way. He didn't say the one across town. He said, the nearest one. And get it on. That's it. That's the, we can't help you with willingness, but we can help you to believe or come to believe, as they did me. Second word. Then they helped me to make a decision. Then they helped me take the actions of 
four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And then I got the results. And the results are the promises that we all know and think and love so well will begin to happen in my life. And then I began to have faith in the program. That's the process. Starting with belief or coming to believe, going through the motions of the steps, getting the results automatically, you begin to experience the, the uh, promises in my life, and then you have faith. And today I know that I know, see, because I went through the process on numerous occasions. I know that. And all those promises that we read about on page 83, th those are promises of our minds, our belief system. He said, if you're painstaking about this phase of our development, which, which phase? The step nine phase. We'll be amazed before we're halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity. We'll know peace. No matter how far down the scale we've gone, we'll see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in self the and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Those are the promises. And the promises don't happen in my body. They happen in my mind. Dr. Yoon told Roland ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which used to be the guiding force of the lives of people, have suddenly cast them to one side, and a whole new set of motives begin to dominate them. These promises are thoughts and ideas and emotions that dominate my life today, internally. And that's the, the result of the steps. I mean, I couldn't do this on my own. But, you know, I had to have, have, to have a beginning here. Now, I understood, excuse me, I'm going to lose my book. I understood now what they mean. And I'm ready to do business on step three. They talked about being reborn. There was a church down the road from me. They used to come over to my house on Monday night to talk to me about being reborn. Man, I'd run them off. I said, boys, you don't have any idea this is Monday night football? And you're here to talk to me about this stuff? Get out of here. That's what I do with them. But now I'm ready to do business. See, I'm no, I understand now what I'm, what the process is about. So I go down to that church on Sunday morning, and I knew about two or three minutes before 11, around 11 o'clock, that's what they did. They asked people basically to come down there and do the third step prayer. That's all they really wanted them to do. And I got there about two or three minutes before 11. <laughs> Didn't want to get there too early. I might hear something to help me, you know. <laughs> and sure enough, they asked people to come down there and do the third step. And as humbly and sincerely and as honestly as I know how, I went there and I did this. I said, God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that I will help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. Sincerely and honestly, I do how. And I'm not smart enough to understand what happened that morning. I don't know. But I do know this. From that Sunday morning until this day, I, my life has not been the same. You can't get from where I was to Pensacola, Florida, other than by the grace of God. It cannot be done from where I was. You can't get here. And that was the beginning. That was the beginning for me. I went on and did the steps. And I, I want to tell you this. We talked a little, I heard some stories about eight and nine over the weekend. And Eight and nine is probably the most healing steps there are in all the program. Six and seven. Did I really like six and seven too? I like them all. <laughs> six and seven. I could see what I'd become. And seven. I needed. I could see what I, what I could what could happen to me. Six and seven. The, the tools of change, if you will. The tools of acceptance. We have a lot of people run around today say, you can just walk around accepting things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> acceptance. Acceptance is not an event. It's a process. And the process begins with six and then seven. 
And remember in that other big, big book, there was a fellow there, and his name was Saul, S-A-U-L. And he was riding his ass on the way to Damascus, where the book goes. Big bolt of lightning knocked him off his ass on his ass, the way I read it. <laughs> and he dusted himself off, you know. Big boy said, hey, Saul, can we talk? Well, yeah, you can talk. Got his attention, didn't he? Alcoholism may have got our attention, too. And uh, he said, yeah, we can talk. What do you want to talk about? He said, Saul, you've been a very selfish and self-centered individual, angry. You've hurt a lot of people in many, many ways. I want you to quit doing that. And he said, well, how do you quit doing that? He said, by doing six and seven, <laughs> basically. And when you do that, you you will change. And remember then that story that that guy in the name of Judas? Judas could not accept what he had done. Kill himself, didn't he? Six and seven is the tools of change, the tools of acceptance. And with that, you can be free. And he said, when you make that change, he said, we'll call you Paul. And remember, in a little town in Corinthians, they asked Paul a question. They said, Paul, what's the secret to life? Everybody wants to know the secret to life, don't they? And he said, the secret to life is daily dying. The old Saul had to die so the new Paul could come alive. I am not what I used to be. And I know some of you guys in this room, you are not what you used to be. Thank God. That was the process. You know, I had been so sick, throwing up sick from drinking, and have horrendous hangovers. I mean, I had horrendous hangovers. And threw up one morning, I was in the shower, and kind of hiccuped a little bit, and about three pints of blood fell out on the floor. A esophagus would rupture you from drinking, smoking, and doing those other things. I almost died. But you know what? Those things never really caused me to want to quit drinking. I mean, it's a factor. But I'll tell you what really caused me to want to quit drinking, and I think if you'll think about it, you will too. It was a guilt, shame, and remorse that I had as a result of how I've harmed other people. That's really what caused me to want to quit drinking. And eight and nine, I could put all those things back together. And I started about to do that. And uh, one of my little stories is, is my little daughter, Gail. Uh, she'd grown up with Phyllis and I drinking and raising cane, and she hated to be around us. And she got graduated from high school at the age of 17 through a bunch of classes she took in the summer so she'd get away from us. And she got married right out of high school just to get away from us. And she hated us, and I don't blame her. But some years later, by this time she was married and got a couple of, got three children. And something happened in her life. One of her sister-in-laws died unexpectedly, leaving a couple of children. And I guess it was about 15 years after we got sober. She called me one day and she said, Papa, I said, if was something would happen to Jim and I, would you, Mama, take the kids? That's when I knew it was okay with us. It wasn't okay with us until then, but that's the morning that I knew it was okay. See, God had put our life back together. My my wife got sober two and a half years later uh, after I first got sober. A year later, we got married. And we've been there for Gail and those kids. And every one of their births, we were there. We've been there with them and helping them, just being there, doing the right thing, mumbling off a few words of I'm sorry. That won't cut it living sober and helping and being there and living a good life. Gail and Jim eventually gave up their stuff and got into their church. They were, they were not alcoholics. They just got into their church, and they're, they're a real force in their church today. They're involved in everything that's going on, mission trips and all, everything. And their little kids have grown up in this. To my knowledge, if those children have ever had a drink, I'm not aware of it. My son, who my grand, great grand, my grandson, great grandson, is now 24 years old and he's in the Air Force uh, over there somewhere right now. And to my knowledge, he never had a drink. If he has, I don't know anything about it. Never heard about it. The chains of alcoholism have been broken in my family. Thank God. Thank God. <clears throat> 
there's another little story in that other book. I like to refer to this book because it all comes there from there ultimately. And uh, the story of this guy that was in uh, Surnan, a little town in Surnan, and he was talking that night or carrying the message or whatever. And after the meeting was over with, they were standing around talking and drinking a little bit of wine, I guess, and smoking a cigarette or two. And they told him about a fellow they had locked up on the, in a cave on the side of the hill. And he said, I'm going to go up there and talk to that guy. And they said, oh, no, don't do that. This guy, we've got him chained to the walls up there. He's a very angry individual, very selfish, very, he harms a lot of people. He said, no, I want to go up there and talk to him. Tell me what his name is. He said, well, his name is Legions, for he is many. Many defects of character, you see. So he went up there to talk to this guy, and he did for him what he did for me. He cut loose the chains of resentment and anger and fear and hatred and set him free from those things. And then afterwards, he said, Legion said, can I go with you and do what you do? And you know, those other 12 guys, he took him with him. But he wrote a little step here for us. And he said, no, Legion said, what I want you to do is just stay here and tell people what happened to you. That's all. Bill calls it, pass it on, I think. And I'm here today trying to pass on the message that was given to me. And I'm very, very thankful that you allowed me the privilege to be here today. Because it is a privilege to be in AA. We were talking, the guys talking earlier. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a grateful, sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for any length of time, you're gonna have to learn to love AA. I mean, love it. And you can't love AA or anybody or anything else unless you respect it. That's why I don't chant after the meetings when we pray. The greatest prayer the world has ever known. I found myself screwing it up through chanting. I don't do that out of respect for the greatest prayer that ever written. I don't do that. I have respect. A lot of things I don't do in AA. You know, I know, I know the steps of the things, the actions that I take. I get a spiritual awakening as a result of those steps. There are traditions, and I wish Bob had time to do the tradition. I've heard him do the tradition. does a great job. Those are things that we don't do. And our service structure, the concepts, is how we interact with each other. Action, non-action, interaction. That's the way that goes when we interact with each other. Uh, so, real, again, talk too long. Thank you for letting me be here. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.